All right, good evening everybody, glad you're here. And uh, one of the things I love about this group is that on Wednesday night, you can expect there to be a good group, uh, and uh, that's, that's a good thing to expect. Uh, let me make one quick announcement. Mr. Gerald is going to have an alarm go off on his phone and then go knock on the doors. Uh, they decided that Mr. Colby and me don't uh, pay attention to the timing very well, and so they said, we're just going to have an alarm, and it, when that goes off, just stop mid-sentence. So... Uh, I don't know if I can do that, but uh, it, maybe it'll help with the little ones coming in. I know sometimes I keep going while they're coming in and showing off their crafts and stuff, and I don't want it to be confusing, and so uh, I think that'll help draw a clear line. I'll do my best to, we'll do our best to wrap it up right then. So when you hear that alarm go off, uh, that's, uh, we're going to try to make that a habit if possible, and uh, he's going to take care of knocking on those doors back there. And no questions, no comments. After that's exactly days. right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You got questions or comments you can send them to Lonnie in an email so all right uh, so we are ready for the book of Nehemiah so if you've not turned there you can go ahead and turn there we've been looking at the book of Ezra and Ezra is a book that's really interesting because we have the first several chapters uh, what is it up to chapter uh, six and that is focused on that first return which takes us from about the year 536 all the way to the year 516. We have a long period of time there because Zerubbabel and Jeshua lead that first return. They get started rebuilding the temple and then they kind of lose their vigor for that. There's opposition, there's distraction as Haggai will tell us, um, and they, they kind of lose their focus. But then in the year 516, we have uh, uh, Zechariah and we have Haggai uh, it's actually a little bit before 516, but Zechariah and Haggai come and they preach, you got to get back to work, and they do get back to work and they finally finish the temple and uh, it's rebuilt. So then Ezra, it, we kind of have to hit the pause button there because we go several decades before the story of Ezra picks back up. So we actually paused right there at the end of chapter 6 and went and looked at the story of Esther, which kind of happens in the middle of all that. When we come back to Ezra, we're in about the year 458, 458. And so that's when Ezra will lead his return. Now, what's Ezra's primary concern when he comes back? Do what? The law. That's right. Um, so we've got the temple being rebuilt from 536 to 516 in that first return led by Zerubbabel. The second return led by Ezra is primarily concerned about making sure the law is being followed. And you would say... 50 years, is that a problem? It seems to have been. It seems to have been a problem with them getting away from the law, especially with what problem was did we, did we read about in the last couple of chapters? Intermarriage with these pagan nations. And we talked about this the other night. I, I think the idea there is in... ...that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you were unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. So the reason we see that Nehemiah is going to God in prayer here is because he knows that God does what? He keeps his promises. And he knows what God has promised. And he knows that if he, he and his people repent, that God will take care of them and God will put them where he has promised that he would put them. And then in verse 10, he says, Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. I pray, please, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servant prosper this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So I think what he's trying to say there as he closes chapter one, he tells us he, he's the king's cupbearer because he wants us when we read it to know who, who he wants to grant his request here. He is going to request, just like Ezra requested to go back home, and get the, the temple rebuilt, he's going to request to go back home and get the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt. And he wants us to know who, who, uh, who he's going to make that request to. 
Yeah, I, if, it, if you're like me, this prayer maybe reminds you of Ezra's prayer. Remember Ezra chapter 9. Now, Nehemiah has a much longer prayer in Nehemiah 9 that when we get to, you know, we'll have to spend some time there. But I love his, so you mentioned both of these ideas, but God is faithful, right? He says that, uh, and, and it seems to me that Ezra not only is a prayerful man, but it seems like he just has scripture running through his mind because the words he says here are almost quotations of other places. And, and I don't know what his access to scripture was like, but he knows the, the, the story of God because he talks about God being keeping covenant and being full of steadfast love. God is faithful. But he says, we are not. And I, it's interesting to me how personal Nehemiah makes this. Like, he doesn't just say Judah's been unfaithful or Israel's been unfaithful. This is uh, at the end of verse 6, even I and my father's house have sinned. That's pretty pretty direct. And, uh, and, and I, don't, I don't think uh, Nehemiah's just being fake there. I think he's saying, look, I recognize my own failures in this. But he says, you kept your word regarding the discipline part. Right. And I, and I don't think Nehemiah is saying that from uh, kind of being mad about it. I think he's saying you said what you were going to do and you did it on the discipline part. And now he's asking, keep your word on the mercy part. Uh, keep that all the way. And so, like, if you look at, for example, I'm just flipping back there quickly. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Um, listen to the words of Deuteronomy 30 in comparison with what Nehemiah says. He says, and when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey His voice and all that I command you with all your heart, with all your soul. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and He will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord has scattered you. So you see that very language that Nehemiah is using about restoration and being brought back and, uh, and, and being gathered uh, even though they've been scattered. So he says, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven. That's what Deuteronomy 30 and verse 4 says. That's the language that he uses. Uh, Mr. Colby mentioned that he's the cupbearer. And I've read different things about cupbearers, but one thing is consistent is that they were remarkably trusted people. Um, so we've heard, and, and I've, I've said this for a long time, that the cupbearer would taste test the food and the wine to make sure that the king wasn't being poisoned. But in some cases, I've read that the cupbearer, because of that position, became so trusted that they didn't want to risk his life because the king trusted him so much. So he would have, the cupbearer would have servants under him who took care of that, and then he would bring it to the king. And so whatever the situation is, in either circumstance, Nehemiah is an extremely trusted advisor to Artaxerxes. And so as the cupbearer, not only is he right there next to him, but that means his counsel is going to be worth something to the king. He's going to be trusted. And so that, that's going to play a part as we come to chapter 2. There you go. Yeah, providence. Of, like, he just so happened to be the cupbearer, right? No, that, that's not the way it is. It's, uh, and you think about the people, the Jewish people who are put in these high prominent positions. It's amazing that they keep crossing over in these ways and that God keeps using the kings uh, of the world to, to put them where they need to be. Um, but it's difficult, I think, to explain how a small nation like Judah gets to make a restoration if there's not God's providence at work and if there's not God's power at work. And so uh, Nehemiah spends a long time, notice it says he's fasting and praying. And I think we've, we, you know, it says for many days, I, I think we've got kind of a long period of time here. So at the beginning, he gets the news in the month of Kislev. Um, and then he, in chapter 2, verse 1, in the month of Nisan, and this prayer, he says, uh, give success to your servant today at the very end of chapter 1. So I think we're, uh, somebody said maybe like 11 months passed. And so I think we've got Nehemiah praying and considering this for a long time and then finally saying, okay, today's the day. Now, now's the time to do something about this. Uh, okay, anything else through chapter 1? Any questions or comments that you'd like to share? I think just because he knows that's where God is supposed to be that's right. and everything, I think it's very impressive. Yeah. The, the circumstances of God's people yes. in the way that it should be, it troubles him. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, and I think that would have been true about Ezra, like Ezra's interest in going back. Um, 
you think about, like I think about Mordecai and Esther, their concern about the people, even though they're kind of scattered around, the idea that they're still, they still have this sense and identity of being God's people. Uh, maybe we'd even say Daniel. Daniel had been there as a young boy, but he lives 70 years or more outside of there, and yet he still turns his face towards Jerusalem when he prays because he just has such attention to uh, what God's going to do uh, in all of that and is praying for that restoration in Daniel mind. Uh, all right, very good. Anything else? Uh, so notice in chapter 1 in verse 2 it says that Hanani, one of my brothers, that word can mean brother, like same parents, or it can mean kinsman. So it, I don't know what your text says, but I think most of them say brothers. He will be mentioned again in chapter 7. He will be made responsible for things because uh, Nehemiah trusts him. So I don't know how close he is related to Nehemiah because that word can mean anything from brother to just kinsman. Uh, but it, it, regardless of that, he comes and gives this report. All right, you ready for chapter 2? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's go to chapter 2. So in the month of Nisan... In the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. So, I, I don't know here. People suggest that being the cupbearer, it was kind of your responsibility not to let your problems come before the king. It just wasn't his problem, and so you didn't need to let your own personal circumstances shape your attitude when you're in the king's presence, right? Bring joy, bring happiness, bring uh, contentment, whatever, when you're serving the king. But it, Nehemiah looks sad. Now, he's been doing this for a long time without being sad in the king's presence, and I almost wonder if this was not intentional, right? That he is saying he's putting on a sad face. He's letting the king see his frustration so that the king will ask him. Now, Nehemiah is afraid, but remember, he's asking for success from the Lord in his prayer, right? So he knows that this is a serious situation. And he said to the king, Love the king, live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may, be, that I may rebuild it. So here he uh, is sad, and the king asks about it, and Nehemiah says, what, else, what other attitude do you want me to have other than sadness? The place, my city, where my father's graves are, it lies desolate. Right, it's, it's been destroyed, the gates are ruined, it's been burned with fire. And so the king asks, what are you requesting? And I love this, several commentators refer to this prayer as an arrow prayer. I can't imagine it took more than half a second for Nehemiah to pray this, right? I don't know what exactly his words are. I don't think it's as long as the prayer that's at the end of chapter 1. I think it's probably, help me, <laughs> I think it's probably something like that. So... In, in between the question and the answer, he's praying. And as Colby may mention, Nehemiah is a prayerful person. And I think this is a really helpful example when we're dealing with situations. I think it's perfectly appropriate that as we take the breath to answer, that we just pray in that moment for the, right, for the words to say. So, you know, God, it's, it's not like we have to get in a corner and kneel down and say in Jesus' name and all of those sorts of things when we're just crying out to God. We just say, Help me. And he knows what we're asking uh, because I'm sure, like Nehemiah had been in conversations with the Lord for a long time about this, right? He'd been meditating on God's word and he'd been petitioning God about it. So when this moment comes, he can say, help me. And, and everybody's on the same page as far as that goes. So when he answers, he wants to be allowed to do what? Go back to Judah, especially to the city of Jerusalem so that he can... Rebuild it. That's exactly right. So the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. It seems to me that Nehemiah already has a plan, right? He's been meditating on this for a long time and has a plan so that when the king asks, he can say, I think it'll take about this long. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. 
and a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates, beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. That sounds just like how Esther would, uh, not excuse me, uh, how Ezra would have said it, doesn't it? Uh, the good hand of God was upon me. And so Nehemiah is given permission by the king to travel through that territory all the way to Judah, and then he's given authority to get materials from the forest in order to be able to use those materials for gate rebuilding, wall rebuilding, and even a place for Nehemiah to live while he's managing all of that. All right, anything through verse 8? Uh, verse 4, where he, where he says the prayer, mm -hmm. reminds me a whole lot of Esther. Mm. You know, and it also reminds me of what Mordecai said to her about who knows if you were not here for a time mm -hmm. such as this. Yeah. The the courage that they both of them had before the king, not knowing how he was going to react, mm -hmm. is is I think noteworthy. That's right. Yeah, he he's running the same risk in some ways that Esther was, right? And and she tells the people, be fasting for me. And I think the implication there would be be praying. Nehemiah's been doing that, and so he that's exactly right as he goes into the presence of the king like this. Very good. I think it's interesting that he's troubled about it, he thinks about it for a while, and then he says, send me. Mm -hmm. Like he didn't, yeah. he didn't request the king, hey, send people and, mm -hmm. and handle this. He says, send me. Yeah. And you're going to see that attitude continue as mm -hmm. we go throughout this. He is a leader of a man. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, and he, he takes responsibility very often. That's right. All right, uh, so anything else through verse 8? So coming to verse 9, we have Nehemiah all ready to go. So he comes to the governors of the province beyond the river, gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. So this is different than Ezra's approach, remember. He doesn't go with, Nehemiah doesn't go without an army. Uh, but uh, it doesn't seem to be, uh, maybe there's this sense that Nehemiah wants to make sure that he comes into the city with a, a clear display of authority, that the king is with him in this. And so to come with Persian soldiers would show Nehemiah has official status in this regard. Now, there's two people here that are going to kind of keep coming up for a while in the story. There's Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, servant, they heard this, and it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. These guys are opposed to somebody helping God's people, which is not going to turn out well for them. If you're opposed to somebody helping God's people, you're in trouble. So Sanballat and Tobiah, we're going to add another guy in a minute, but these are going to be the two primary oppositions to the work that Nehemiah wants to do. So he comes to Jerusalem, he's there three days, and he gets up in the night and just has a few people and he rides around the city. And so it looks like he goes out and then um, he's, just, he's just observing the, the wall and where it's broken down. And in fact, he has to get off of his animal at some point and walk because it's not, uh, it's not safe enough for him to walk around uh, with his animal underneath him. And so... Nobody knows who, what he's doing. Look at verse 16. The officials did not know where I'd gone or what I was doing. I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Nobody knows what Nehemiah is involved in at this moment. Uh, he is kind of doing a nighttime observation of what's going on, maybe so he can make sure and formulate a good plan before he jumps right into the work. Doesn't want to give away anything, doesn't want to speak too quickly, a very thoughtful man, and he's looking at the walls. And so he'll come in verse 17 through 20, and he will talk to them. Okay, so in verse 17, you see the trouble we're in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good. And also the words of the king had, the, the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? And then I replied to him, 
the God of heaven will make us prosper and we His servants will arise and build, but you have no portion, right, or claim in Jerusalem. So when, when Nehemiah brings up this idea of rebuilding, what's the reaction of the people of, in Jerusalem? They like the idea. Let us rise up and build. So Nehemiah has a plan. He's able to talk about, as Mr. Timmy may mention, he's able to talk about how God's providence has been with him. The people buy into this, and they say, well, if that's the way it's going to go, let's rise up and build. Now, Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem is another one that we're introduced here. They mock this idea. You've got the authority of the king. Are you not rebelling against the king in doing this? Maybe there had been some, I think really in the days of Ezra, there had been some decrees that were keeping them from doing this, right? Like Ezra chapter 4 when those enemies come up and the king sins and says, stop the work. They don't know what Nehemiah knows at this moment, which is he has the direct authority of the king because he's been in his presence. So when he comes back, but notice he doesn't say, oh no, I got the king on my side. Who does he say he's got on his side? The God of heaven will make us prosper. So even though their challenge is, oh, so I bet you're rebelling against the king, I think Nehemiah is kind of saying, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter who I'm rebelling against. I've got God on my side. They don't know the full story, though. They don't know that he has the king on his side as well. But that's not the most important thing to Nehemiah. The most important thing to Nehemiah is that he's got the good hand of God on him, and that's what's made the difference all along. Okay. You know, it, it seems that up until Nehemiah came back, there possibly may not have been good, great leadership in Jerusalem itself. Mm. I don't even. Uh, I think Bob Waldron mentioned that they possibly might not have even had a governor. So mm. the closest, the closest thing they would have had to rulers would have been those that were ruling the regions around there, like. Sanballat, I think, was over the region of Samaria. Mm. Tobiah was over the region of the Ammonites. So this is a people that would not want to see the Jews be able to rise up and rebuild. Mm. So they're going to do everything that they can possibly do to keep them from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. All right, anything else through chapter 2? All right, you want to take us through chapter 3? However much you want to of that. All right. Let's just start reading in verse 1. Elishib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priest, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors. They built as far as the Tower of the Hundred and consecrated it, then as far as the Tower of Hanel. Now, next to Elishib, the men of Jericho built, and next to them, Zakur, the son of Imri, built. Also, the sons of Hassaniah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors and its bolts and bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Kaz, made repairs. Next to them, Meshulam, the son of Ber Berakai, the son of Meshezebel, Mesh made repairs. Next to them, Zadok, the son of Baana, made repairs. Next to them, the Tekoites made repairs, but their nobles did not put their shoulders to the work of their Lord. So I guess what I would have to say about through those first five verses is, and I think Larson alluded to this as we got kind of got started, you see the, the organization skills that Nehemiah has. Nehemiah, he, he has a plan going forward. It ain't like he just comes in here and just wings this job. He, he has he lays things out very specific. So um, I'm going to skip on down. Can, can I just say, yes. okay, so that yes. word repaired, the word repaired I think is used 35 times in chapter 3. Uh, so it's, it's repeated over and over again. The word repaired here uh, just means to make firm or strong. So I don't think that it necessarily means that the wall is restored to as good as it was before. I think it's just made sufficient. It's made as good as it needs to be at this moment. So uh, I don't know that in the 52 days that this is going to take, I don't know that they're able to build the wall back to the status that it was before, but they are able to make it firm and to make it strong. And so notice, uh, as, as Mr. Colby is looking there, uh, we have a lot of names mentioned and one of the phrases that we see repeated a couple of times 
So, like, look at the uh, verse 10. Next to them, Jediah, the son of Harumph, repaired opposite his house. Um, and that phrase is going to be repeated several times through the chapter. And I think that indicates it's almost as if the people just kind of take responsibility for what's right in front of them, right? What's right across from their house. Uh, and that, that's, that's good, right? Not everybody does that. Other people are repairing different kind of gates. The priests are involved and things like that. But if, they, if everybody fixes the wall right in front of their house, then they're going to have a pretty good section of the wall finished. Uh, so there's like personal responsibility, personal benefit to this, and it also benefits the whole city. So as far as the rest of chapter 3 goes, I don't really see uh, a lot of benefit right now in going through and reading those names. I know that's what, why Larson gave me chapter 3. <laughs> but but uh, basically, the I think the idea here is, or what I gather from it, is what he said. Plus, we see how Nehemiah is very specific about the way that he wants God's work done here. Mm -hmm. He don't just he doesn't just uh, throw things out there and see where it sticks. That's right. So as you go through this chapter and you read, um, if you look at their occupations, we find priests involved. We find priest servants working. We find goldsmiths mentioned. We find perfume makers mentioned, and we find merchants mentioned. And there may be other jobs that are mentioned there as well. But I don't know about much about perfume makers, right? I've never had that job before. Uh, but you wouldn't think those would be the most qualified people to be building a wall, right? And yet, I don't think there's a single job that's mentioned here that means professional wall builder, right? I don't think, I don't think you read about any timber cutters. I don't think you read about bricklayers. I don't think you read about anything like that. The people who are involved in this work are kind of stepping outside of their normal work but they're ready to do it because they know it's God's will that it needs to be done. They know it's God's work to do. And so that's really interesting that you don't have to be an expert uh, in the work that God has called you to do. Uh, he's equipping them to be involved in this work. And Nehemiah's leadership, I think, is a helpful part of all of that. And that, proves, that proves to us that uh, we all may have a talent if we use it. That's right. And we all don't have the same talent. That's exactly right. Yeah. And they're able to work together in this regardless of what their background is. Miss Amanda, what were you going to say? Mm, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I should have mentioned that for sure. I think that's, uh, it may be the only place that it mentions his daughters, but this is a whole family affair, right? Like everybody is involved in it to the degree that they need to be. So just think about uh, the city of Jerusalem. I mean, it, it, if you just read through this, you say, it looks like everybody's excited about this, at least within the city. I mean, at least a lot of people are excited about the work that, that's right in front of them. And Nehemiah evidently was a very compelling person. His story was compelling. His leadership is, his plan is, and people join in to do that work. And I, th <clears throat> I think one of the major things going along with what y'all are talking about here that we can take from this, and I meant to mention this a while ago, is... This work has been needing to be done for a very long time now. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's not like this is something that just now came up. They've been laying there in ruins for a very long time. It seems to me that anybody that would have had enough faith in God to have wanted to take this work on, God would have blessed them to do it. It didn't have to be Nehemiah, mm -hmm. but it could, it could have been anybody. But we see we see the the faith of Nehemiah here finally gets this job going. That's right. That's right. Very good. All right. And, and the yeah. people and the people along oh, yeah. with it. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. So like you said, any great work, you just do what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. And the guy beside you is doing what's in front of him. You can accomplish mm -hmm. a lot. And I think that the application to us is when we're trying to teach the gospel, we'll just teach the people that we come in contact mm -hmm. with. And the brethren will teach the people they come in contact with. Yeah. We can a lot of work can get done that way. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that, that's interesting because those nobles, some of the rich men in Judah are going to come up as a problem again. And we may, we may even run into that tonight. Um, and uh, so they, they become a problem. And so it seems like the ordinary folks are on board, but maybe not everybody, like you're saying. Not everybody wants to lower themselves to that. Yeah. Anything? They do. Yeah, they do. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some of them who had the ability were able to, to do more than one place. That's right. That's right. Uh, okay, very good. All right, so let's come to chapter 4. Um, when we come to chapter 4, we've got Sanballat. They heard, that, so notice that, like, I think this is Nehemiah writing it, right? I think he's, I don't know that he's writing it the day that it's all happening, but at least at some point he's re recollecting his story. Uh, now, when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and great, greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and in the, and the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it up in a day? Will they receive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him. He said, yes, what they are building. If a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. And then Nehemiah says, hear, O, hear, o our God, for we are despised turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. Do not cover their guilt and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. Now, that's a strong prayer from Nehemiah, right? Uh, let them get what they're saying we should get. Uh, don't remove their guilt from them. I think what Nehemiah's prayer here is, is Revel uh, excuse me, Romans chapter 12. Don't take your own vengeance. Leave room for the wrath of God. I think that's what Nehemiah is doing. Nehemiah is not saying, boy, I'm going to get those guys. He's saying the Lord will take care of that. The Lord will take care of what these people are doing. So verse 6, we built the wall, and the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. I think we've already seen that. I think we see that displayed in chapter 3. I think we hear that in their words. Let us rise up and build at the end of chapter 2. And Nehemiah, reflecting on these people, say they had a mind to work, and that's why they were able to be so successful. All right, now, when they hear about this, um, the, the enemies do, Sambalat and Tobiah and, and these different groups, when they hear about it, they were angry, and they wanted to come and fight against Jerusalem and cause confusion against it. In verse 9, And we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. You see both prayer to God, trusting Him, and making some practical applications of what they need to do, right? They pray and set a guard day and night. They're watchful. Uh, it's not as if they just say, well, we can say a prayer and be done with it. They also take on the responsibility of guarding what's going on here. Um, now, in Judah, it was said to those, of those who bear the burden is falling, there is too much rubble by ourselves. We'll not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them to stop the work. At that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. So in their lowest parts of space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. So they're afraid of what's about to happen. And Nehemiah says, well, we can take care of that. And he puts, puts military men around. And then he encourages the men who are building the wall and says, don't be afraid. Remember what you're doing. You are building for your brothers and your sisters or your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. That's what we're doing this for. So don't be afraid. And that's a very uh, good rallying cry for the courage of these men as they're building the wall and uh, as they're, they're standing defense over the city. You know, real quick, this reminds me of the men back when Zerubbabel came back mm -hmm. to build the temple. Mm -hmm. You know, the men that came against them, that same, I see that here too. However, I see a lot greater leadership, I think, in Nehemiah here mm -hmm. than what Zerubbabel showed at that particular time. Yeah. Maybe I'm wrong there. But. Mm -hmm. You're saying this is, a, this is a better moment for Nehemiah. He yes. steps up and says, yes. hey, we're not going to let these people yeah, discourage us. They were, they were trying to make them quit. Yeah. I think they knew the king couldn't do anything about it, so mm -hmm. they were going to try to shame them into yeah. quitting. But Nehemiah said, no, we're going, we're going mm -hmm. home. Yeah, that's right. That's right. 
Yeah. Uh, so look at look at verses fifteen and following. Um, God had frustrated their plan. We all returned to the wall, each to his work. From that day on, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, shields, bows, and coats of mail. And the leaders stood behind the whole house of Judah who were building on the wall. Those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon in the other. Right? He's got kind of sword and trowel in his hand. And each of the builders had his sword strapped at his side while he built. The man who sounded the trumpet was beside me. And I said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, the work is great and widely spread. And we are separated on the wall far from one another. In the place where you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So he's calling upon them to rally to that point to help fight. But he wants them to know that when they rally to that point, it's not going to be their capability. It's not going to be their power that overcomes. He says, our God will fight for us in that place. And I think that's a, an incredible call. Because he's saying we're so spread out. We can't get this work done if we all stand right together. We've got to stay spread out. But when you hear the trumpet, rally to that point. There, God will fight for us. Uh, amazing, amazing. So they work, and he says uh, in, in 22, they work from the break of dawn till the stars come out, 21. And I also said to the people at that time, let every man and his servant pass the night within Jerusalem, that they may be a guard for us by day, by night, and may labor by day. So neither I nor my brothers nor my servants nor the men of the guard who followed me, none of us took off our clothes. Each kept his weapon at his right hand. So I guess they take rest shifts, but they don't, they don't undress. They don't take their sword off. They're ready to get right back up and go if they need to. This is a pretty intense period of time, pretty, pretty serious engagement in this work in front of them. All right. Yeah. Yeah, so mine say, uh, my, the, it has a footnote that could say, or weapon when he was drinking. Is that what your text says? Oh, yeah, yeah, to the water. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I did read something about that in a commentary that there were different interpretations of what that means. So, but I think the idea is either they went to get it, even when they went to get a drink of water, or they just kept it at their right hand all the time. I think I think there's a question about what that Hebrew word meant in translation. But I think it, the the idea is they kept it at ready access all the time. Yeah. All right. Do we want to try number chapter five? I think we got three minutes, four minutes. I think I can summarize part of it. Maybe. Yeah, that'd be great. Whether it's right or not, I yeah. don't know. Yeah, no, I, I, I feel it. So, so the way I understand chapter 5 here is, if I understand it correctly, it would have been against Jewish law for the Jewish leaders to tax their their brethren on goods. Is that correct? Yes, is I think so. You understand? Yeah. So, but when Nehemiah is, is doing this work, the people begin to, I don't know if it's because they're exerting so much energy and putting so much time into building the wall, but they begin to run out of food and get hungry and they're really falling on hard times here. So one of the reasons is, is because they're having to pay interest on, on the goods that they have there to their own, to their own kinsmen. And that's wrong. So Nehemiah sees that and he, he becomes angry about it, basically, and he he begins to put a stop to it. And he tells them, we're not going to do that anymore. So what I get out of the rest of the chapter here is that he kind of, not only does he tell them that, but he leads by example. And he go, he finishes up by saying, look, you know, I'm the governor here now, and I'm not even going to eat of the king's provisions like I, like I could. I'm going to I'm going to take on a very conservative way of life and I'm going to do that in order to help my people get their uh keep their livelihood up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the rich are taking advantage of the poor. They're making them basically mortgage their land using the fees from that to pay their taxes. It's putting all the pressure on the the people at the bottom. And so Nehemiah actually says he's not going to take a salary, right? He's not going to take the government's pay. He's not going to take their food supply. And, and I want you to notice two reasons. So verse 15, their servants lorded over the people, but I did not do so, one, because of the fear of God, right? So that's one reason why he doesn't do it. And then the end of verse 18, because the service was too heavy on this people. Nehemiah has his relationship with the Lord, right? 
I'm not going to do this because I fear the Lord. And he has relationships with other people, right? The, be- the burden was too heavy on the people. He's got love God and love your neighbor both in mind appropriately here. Nehemiah is a good man. And I love his prayer, verse 19. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I've done for this people. He just wants God to see it. He's not doing it for his own preeminence. He's not doing it for his own position. He's doing it because he wants God to remember his work. All right, any comments or questions? You have about 15 seconds. <laughs> yes, the nobles here are a problem again. Nehemiah addresses it. They do say, we won't do that anymore. So that, that, that's good that they get on the same page. All right. Did we beat the alarm? <laughs> <You're going? laughs> Thank you all for your good attention. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.